Good evening, good evening everybody. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jim Anaya. I'm the Dean of the Law School, and I'd like to welcome you all to the 42nd Austin W. Scott Jr. Lecture. Uh, the Scott Lecture was established in 1973 by former Dean Sears in memory of Professor Austin Scott, who taught at our law school and enriched our community for 20 years. Now, Professor Scott excelled not only in teaching, but as a scholar. Every year we select a member of our faculty who emulates this ideal to give the Scott Lecture. Uh, as you can see from the list of previous speakers inside your program, selection as a Scott Lecture is indeed a recognition of remarkable excellence and achievement. It's with great enthusiasm that tonight we include in this distinguished list of, scholar, of Colorado teachers and scholars, Professor Frederick Bloom. Professor Bloom joined the University of Colorado Law School in uh, 2012. Previously, he was at Brooklyn Law School, where he earned Teacher of the Year multiple times, and he's continued that streak here, earning new Teacher of the Year his first year and a number of teacher teaching awards every year since then. He was recognized at the campus level in 2014 with the Provost Faculty Achievement Award for his article, Suing Courts, and recently his article, Law's Clock, earned the Gordon Graham Justice Award. In addition to his accolades, Professor Bloom performs outstanding service here at the law school, connecting with a greater community through outreach as one of our many law school instructors, supporting students as advisor to the Colorado Law Chapter of Veteran Students of America, and supporting our faculty by consistently serving on um, sometimes tedious committees uh, and in his role as Associate Dean for Research. And tonight, we are fortunate to have the opportunity to listen as he turns our attention to the role of silence in the law and the justice system, sharing with us three stories that examine what is said sometimes most loudly when nothing is said at all. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Frederick Bloom presenting Silence and Noise. I would like tonight to tell three stories, to recount three tales in turns compelling and confusing, tragic and triumphant, familiar and forgotten. The first is the story of Ernest Miranda, an Arizona native, a day laborer, an accused kidnapper, and a man whose name now features in nearly every crim pro syllabus, not because of what he wanted to say, but because of what he didn't. The second is the story of Gaethy and Marie Barnett, two West Virginia schoolgirls, Jehovah's Witnesses in a mine pock town just outside of Charleston, two faces for a totemic First Amendment decision, not because of what they wanted to stand and recite, but because of what they didn't. And the third story is the story of Carol Ankenbrandt, a Missouri citizen, a young mother doing all she could to protect two daughters from an abusive father and a beleaguered litigant unsure of her access to federal court, not because of what Congress had said about jurisdiction, but because of what it hadn't. I hope tonight to tell these three stories briefly, but meaningfully, and I hope too to show what they might have to do with each other and what we might have, what we might learn by looking at them together. But first, something crucial. I should set some markers and acknowledge some debts. One debt runs to all of you. My colleagues, our students, CU staff, all here for attending tonight. There are, I know, countless other things you could be doing. Reading for exams, <laughs> watching the Avs play the Columbus Blue Jackets, pondering the fate of the American experiment, but I appreciate you making time to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Additional debts run to a cast of very generous enablers. John Sabre, Chloe, and Aaron, and our phenomenal IT crew, the great Diana Avalis, and our spectacular faculty assistant team, Julianne and Julia, and our ACE events staff, Jane and Matt, and our incredible library unit, so gifted at tracking down sources flung far and near. 
it's a cliche, I think, to say that the heart and genius of this place can be found where we rarely look. With this group, John and Diana and Jane and Julianne and Matt, it's still a cliche. It's also true. Yet another debt runs to our dean, Jim Anaya. Dean Anaya asked me to deliver this lecture before really knowing anything about me. It's a gesture of generosity and a leap of administrative faith that I'll try not to prove unfounded, or at least too unfounded, though perhaps we'll soon see why I've never been asked to give a public lecture before. <laughs> and this isn't just a public lecture. This is the Scott Lecture, established, as Dean and I said, in 1973 by then Dean Don Sears in honor of Professor Austin Scott, Jr., a more than 20-year member of the CU Law faculty. 1973 was just seven short years after Professor Scott, then only 50, lost a painful and protracted battle with cancer. In Professor Scott's honor, the first Scott lecture was delivered by Homer Clark, the second by Howard Clemmy, a generous presence who not only still sometimes graces these halls, but is here. Thank you for being here. By all accounts, Professor Scott was a gentle person and a timeless soul. He drove a 1930s Chrysler until at least 1965. <laughs> he never missed a performance of the Hungarian String Quartet. And he taught Saturday classes, then part of regularly scheduled law school fair, because he couldn't stomach the thought of assigning them to anybody else. He wrote, too. He wrote about trusts, about probate, and perhaps most famously about criminal law. About all of those things, he wrote books, and he wrote articles, and he wrote treatises. But not just that. He wrote at also at length and without attention to men confined in prisons throughout the United States, men with tough and technical legal questions, and men who always, without exception, received seven, eight, ten-page responses from Professor Austin Scott, Jr., who in turn never mentioned any of this to his colleagues and deans. In this, you could say he was silent amidst the noise, a man of some share of greatness and some measure of humility. I hope to do his name and my dean's blind faith some small honor here. My title tonight may well have befuddled and bemused Professor Scott. He wrote articles with titles like The Revocable Trust and the Surviving Spouse's Statutory Share in Colorado, and The Supreme Court's Control over Federal and State Juries, and joint bank accounts, gifts, and transfers in trust. I have no such title and no such topic. I mean instead to talk about silence and noise. Of the two, I mean mostly to talk about the former, to engage those spaces where things are quiet, those places where we hear something in nothing, those corners where someone, a person, a court, a legislator, speaks loudest by saying no words at all. Put differently, I want to discuss legal silence, not just as an absence of sound or meaning or salience, but as all of those things, perhaps, at once. Even more, I aim to understand legal silence within and as a part of our relentlessly noisy world, not just the clutter and clatter of our everyday existence, the tweets and the blogs and the perpetual news cycles, but also the proliferation of formal law, the statutes, state and federal, the rules, state and federal, the opinions, judicial and otherwise, that make up what our own Pierre Schlag might call, with greater passion and poetry, the lawification of everything. In the end, I'd like to quiet that clatter for a moment and to search out what's behind it, to cut through this noise, to hear the silence, and to see how that silence may well add up to a strange noise of its own. Here's how. I will start with an attempt to introduce the concept generally. Here I want to dip a quick toe in the expansive, eclectic, and decidedly odd universe of what might be called silence studies. I will draw on these studies of rhetoric, etymology, sociology, and yes, law, to ask what silence is, how we might understand it, and where legal academics appear to misconstrue it. I hope then, to draw that conceptual frame more explicitly into law. This step will involve part theory, part survey, and part case study, in that order, more or less. 
Here I aim first to outline more fully a theory of silence as a legally salient entity. An absence, sure, but also sometimes an assertion of right, an articulation of meaning, and an expression of power. I hope then, second, to sketch a provisional survey to draw a very quick and hasty but necessary map of legal silence's wide doctrinal terrain. And then I hope, third, to return to our three stories, Miranda, Barnett, and Ankenbrand, and to explore legal silence on the ground, rooting this admittedly airy and ephemeral discussion in the sturdier soil of life and law. After that, I will pose a question. What can and do we make of all of this? Or as many of you are surely already thinking, so what? Here I will suggest four reasons to stay tuned, four reasons that this all might matter. One is about connection. It's about bringing together things too often held apart. Putting, pulling Miranda and Ankenbrandt, for example, out of their discrete legal galaxies, one criminal procedure, the other federal courts, and putting them on the same academic page. A second is about comparison. It's about assessing in sharp counterpoint pieces not before placed side by side. Asking what Miranda's tale about the rights of the accused, for example, has in common with Barnett's story about school children's speech and what still keeps them distinct. A third reason is about coherence. It is about searching out if there's a kind of logic or illogic to be found in a deeper study of legal silence if there is, so to speak, a kind of pattern in the noise. And the fourth reason is about capacity. It is about engaging our ability, our need, and our willingness to understand legal silence for what it is and will always be, an absence and a presence, a problem and a solution, an end and an invitation, a sign of weakness and an expression of power, sometimes all at once. One final acknowledgment. This one to irony. I see it, and I know you do too. We can all spot the irony of me teasing out the meaning of legal silence by talking so much. Rest assured, I considered very strongly and very, very recently just asking all of you to sit quietly with me for the next 40 minutes. <laughs> um, we could all use the break from the noise. But here we are, and as John Cage once said, we must conceive of silence in order to open up our ears. I thank you for opening your ears to me tonight. Let's dig in. The idea of silence may seem too obvious to warrant much elaboration. We all know what it is, or to paraphrase Justice Stewart from a very different context, we all know it when we don't hear it. The very word silence conjures not sounds so much as ingrained mental images. Tranquil marble halls, serene open fields, oppressive exam rooms, places emptied of the clanks and hums and whistles of modern life. But dig deeper. The etymological roots of our word silence sink down through linguistic soil in directions that won't surprise. Silence itself comes from the Latin silentium, itself a derivation of the word sileri, meaning to be without sound. But Sileri has antecedents too. One, a Latin word, decineri, meaning stop. Another, a Gothic, ver a Gothic verb, anasilon, meaning the wind dying down. All of these etymologies, and many more like them, suggest that silence is best understood as a kind of void, a negative, a lack, an interruption or cessation of something else, an end to something more vibrant, more active, more meaningful. Every contemporary dictionary, from Merriam-Webster to the Oxford English, falls in accord. But this isn't, I think, quite right, or quite right enough. There's more to silence than just that. I don't mean that the etymologists and the dictionaries are wrong as far as they go. I mean that they don't go far enough. Their definitions are incomplete, and by virtue of being incomplete, misleading. Silence can indeed be the absence of voice or a state of meaninglessness, as so many have so often said. But silence can also be exactly the opposite. It can be voice, truth, and more. It can be vibrant, active, and meaningful all on its own. 
on this point, students of rhetoric and sociology seem to outpace devoted wordsmiths and students of law, though I will hope to show that lawyers, especially, should know better. Rhetoricians like Mary and Constable, sociologists like Cheryl Glenn, they've looked for and found something more than nothing in silence. But lawyers mostly haven't. Consider the definition of silence used by one prominent legal academic in a recent and fairly prominent book. There, on his very first page, the scholar describes silence as an alienation, a frustrating inarticulateness, a meaningless gap, a void. To him, silence is nothing. And for a legal scholar building a case, this is a useful starting place, a handy argumentative foil. It is, without question, a great point to argue against. But it's also a straw man. No one, not etymologists, not, rhetor not rhetoricians, not us, should think of silence that way. Silence is no mere ab absence. It is not nothing. It can be, in law and elsewhere, far more than that, more than absence, more than void, more than inarticulateness, more than meaninglessness. It can be, among countless other things, a specific and targeted rhetorical act. It can be an expression of intent and consequence. It can be a strategic assertion of will and authority. And it can be an invitation to dialogue and a part of dialogue itself. As the poet Adrian Rich once wrote, silence can be a plan rigorously executed. Do not confuse it with any kind of absence. This may seem obvious on reflection. Of course silence can be more than nothing. Of course silence can carry meaning and import. In fact, lawyers should be especially alert and alive to this truth. For it is law and legal stories that often depict silence at its most meaningful, most potent, and most worthy of attention. But being obvious on reflection is very different from being an intuitive truth. So we should think more, more often, and more carefully about the law and silence. And we should note how sometimes the two are really one. Here, then, I would offer an amendment to David Melenkoff's famous definition of our noble calling. Melenkoff, a lawyer, a professor, an author, and a self-described legal writing curmudgeon, once said, law is a profession of words. Law is a profession of words. It's true. And note that whether Melenkoff intended this or not, profession here strikes on at least three different registers. One. Law is an occupation and a calling. It is a job, that is, it is a profession. Two, law is also an avowal or declaration by way of language. That is, it is a profession of words. And three, law is sometimes merely an appearance or a pretense, a posture without commitment. That is, it is a profession of words. This is all true. Law is all of these things, good and bad. But that's not quite all law is. Law isn't just a profession of words. It is also, I believe, on all three registers, a profession of silence. Law is a profession of silence. Our next step considers where and how. In some ways, I hope, I've already planted the seed of a theory. I've claimed that contrary to standard references and perhaps quick intuition, silence is not mere absence or void, but its own kind of presence, power, meaning, articulateness. I hope now to substantiate this claim, to root it in the soil of human narrative and contemporary doctrine. But I should first add a necessary layer to the theoretical account, a bit more context for the analytical frame this edition may invoke a bit of abstruse vocabulary, a touch of admittedly thin political theory, and a handful of inherently elusive terms. But it will end in a clear, useful, and noteworthy place all the same. Understanding silence as legally salient, the law as a profession of silence, can bridge or at least shorten the gap between seemingly incompatible conceptions of our legal and political universe. Now, as much as ever, that's important. And Justice Brandeis, perhaps unintentionally, shows us how. 
Consider two Brandeis opinions separated by just one year in time, but what might seem in some ways like an unspannable intellectual gap. The first opinion comes in Whitney versus California, a 1927 case involving the prosecution of Charlotte Anita Whitney under California's Criminal Syndicalism Act, an expansive law that prohibited, among other things, membership in any organization advocating crime, sabotage, or unlawful acts as a means of accomplishing a change in industrial ownership or control or affecting any political change. Whitney's crime? Helping to found the Communist Labor Party of America. Whitney challenged her conviction under the 14th Amendment arguing that the California law provided inadequate notice and thus exceeded the state's legislative authority. But she lost, unanimously. All seven justices involved that day agreeing to affirm her conviction. Justice Brandeis agreed too. But Justice Brandeis's vote here was halting, even hesitant. Unlike the majority, which believed that words motivated by so little as a, quote, bad tendency, could be grounds for a criminal conviction, Justice Brandeis worried about consequences. He worried about stifled speech. In fact, he worried that stifling speech might tear at the fabric of the American Republic. And so he wrote, those who won our independence believed that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties. They believed that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth, and that the greatest menace to freedom is an inert people. In this account, speech is key. Speaking as you think is vital, crucial, necessary. So the framers, Justice Brandeis writes, eschewed silence. They valued speech, and more than that, they viewed compelled silence as governmental power exercised in its worst possible form. This is a suggestive vision, an image of virtuous citizens, free to think and speak as conscience requires, and then doing precisely that for the good of the community, their state, and their nation. But this isn't just an interesting portion, a portrait. It is also, I think, a kind of classic small r republicanism, a belief that one chief goal of the state is to promote collective deliberation a kind of self and communal discovery through active social discourse. Silence here isn't just quiet. It is contrary in its way to the national good, dangerous, destructive, a failure to heed a common call and to perform a necessary civic duty. But compare this to a second Brandeis opinion. This just a year later in United States v. Olmsted, a 1928 decision later overruled that allowed certain wiretapped communications, between bootleggers, no less, to be introduced at trial. Here, the court was not unanimous. It split 5-4, just as Brandeis, one of four who penned solo dissents. And there, he wrote, the makers of our Constitution undertook to secure conditions favorable to the pursuit of happiness. They sought to protect Americans in their beliefs, their thoughts, their emotions, and their sensations. They conferred as against the state the right to be left alone. The right to be left alone. The right to be left alone. In this account, privacy is key, hallowed, revered, critical. So the framers, Justice Brandeis tells us, embraced isolation and retreat. They valued individual independence, and more than that, they meant to carve out a space free from the government's long reach. This, too, is a suggestive vision, an image of self-aware and autonomous citizens at liberty to think and feel as they choose, and doing just that, ultimately, so that a community of free thinkers and actors could bloom. But this is more than an interesting portrait. It is also, I think, a kind of classic small-l liberalism, a belief that the state should encourage self-determination and human diversity, a kind of community by way of motley autonomy. Silence here isn't just quiet. It is sacred, necessary, at the very heart of our variegated national identity. But note the tension here. Note the strain between Brandeis's visions in Whitney and Olmsted. 
One advocates a kind of civic duty to speak, the other a private right to be absent from the public sphere. One worries about inert citizens, the other celebrates withdrawal. One fears silence, the other embraces it. My aim here isn't to pick between these two visions. I don't think I could. My aim instead is to say that my anchor conception of legal, uh, legal silence can absolve us of the need to choose. It can bridge the gap between Whitney and Olmsted, Republicanism and liberalism, Brandeis and himself, clumsily but significantly reinforcing the very notion we outlined before. Silence can be voice, not void, an expression at times of will and character and meaning. It can be power. And so it can be both problem and solution, too. By this definition, republicanism and liberalism are on the table together. By this definition, that is, just as Brandeis isn't an inconsistent waffler buffeted about by fickle commitments, he's descriptively right. Speech matters in good ways and bad. And so does silence, too. In fact, think for a moment of just a few of the legal places that silence matters where it isn't, for ill or for good, inert, meaningless, inarticulate. Think of waiver doctrine, where things unsaid at one stage of litigation are necessarily forfeited in others. Think of Federal Rule of Evidence 801 D2B, where parties can adopt the admissions of others simply by saying nothing. Think of contract doctrine, where we must contend with terms within contracts that demand silence like non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality clauses, and we must deal with contracts that leave vital things unsaid. And think, too, of privilege doctrine, where parties to particular conversations or relationships are silenced by law in court. All of these and more merit excavation, elaboration, all show the law indeed as a profession of silence. But let's focus on three other stories here. Let's focus on Miranda, a case like Olmstead about evidence in criminal courts. Let's focus on Barnett, a case like Whitney about speech tendencies of a sort. And let's focus on Ankenbrand, a case like both and like neither about governmental power exercised problematically. And let's begin with Miranda. The story of Ernest Miranda has more than its share of tragedy. Born in Mesa, Arizona in 1940, Miranda lost his mother before he turned seven. He and his father were never close. Between 1949 and 1963, Miranda's path was rocky, checkered, marked by frequent runs in reform school, multiple stints in juvenile custody, and an unhappy 15 months in the Army, six of which he spent at hard labor in the Fort Campbell stockade. After what the service then called an undesirable discharge, as well as a couple of months in the federal penitentiary at Chillicothe, Ohio, Miranda found a glimmer of hope and stability. He met a woman named Twyla Hoffman, eight years his senior, and settled into life with Twyla and her son back in Mesa. He filled his days and sometimes his nights working long shifts as an employee at United Produce. On March 2nd, 1963, a young woman was kidnapped and raped on her way home from her shift selling concessions at the Paramount Theater in downtown Phoenix. She didn't see her attacker well, but she gave a description, slender, glasses, dark curly hair, Mexican or maybe Italian. And she recalled a rope strung across the front seat of a car, an Oldsmobile or maybe a Ford, perhaps a Packard, with a license plate reading something like DLF 312. The police never found that plate. But they did find, eventually, a Packard with a plate reading DFL 317. And the car attached to that plate was registered to a name we just heard, Twyla Hoffman. Even more, when the police first glimpsed the car in Hoffman's driveway, they saw a rope strung along the back of the front seat. When they knocked at Hoffman's door, she answered and beckoned Miranda asleep after a 12-hour night shift. Once awake, Miranda was taken to the station 
and identified in a lineup half-heartedly by the young woman. She said she wasn't sure. A two-hour investigation fo interrogation followed, and a confession written in Miranda's spidery cursive emerged. He was, soon after, convicted and sentenced to 20 to 30 years. At no point, even after he had counsel, was he advised of his right to counsel. In time, the Supreme Court granted cert, agreeing to assess Miranda's claim with three others of a coerced confession. He won. Splitting five to four, the court invalidated his conviction. Chief Justice Warren writing that a criminal defendant must be, quote, clearly informed of his right to consult an attorney. So Miranda could walk, and the others could too, and the case and its name quickly wove itself into our national fabric, adding a thread not too distant from Justice Brandeis' idea in Olmstead about the right to be silent. But we should be careful here. Just a few years ago in Salinas v. Texas, the court scolded those who trade in, quote, misconceptions about Miranda, reminding everyone that the Fifth Amendment does not contain an unqualified right to remain silent. It says something else, something more tempered, mitigated. But if Miranda isn't about a silence right in the purest sense, it is still about silence all the way down. Consider two important but less familiar silence layers here. One, silent approaches. Begin with a passage from the second part of Chief Justice Warren's Miranda opinion. There, the court recounts the struggle to embed certain procedural protections in the Bill of Rights, as well as the continuing need to resist official misconduct, the beaten defendants, the lying witnesses, the trumped up charges. But it was not only overt and noisy misconduct that troubled the Miranda court. It was precisely the opposite, too. Illegitimate and unconstitutional practices get their first footing, the court wrote, by silent approaches and slight deviations from legal modes of procedure. By silent approaches and slight deviations from legal modes of procedure. Silence in this account is not individual right or noble reserve. It's a foothold for illegitimacy, the place from which unconstitutional practice often springs. It is dangerous, pernicious, surreptitious, deceiving. But there's more here, too. Two, silent acquiescence. Silence is also in Miranda the foothold for something else, not just for governmental misconduct, but for something restorative and good. Silence is the foothold for the solution to the problem. It is the source of the very right Miranda proclaims. Here's how. As the court often does, then and now, it turned in Miranda to history for support and authority, assuring all that its holding was not a bolt out of the legal blue. The right Miranda recognized the court assured, simply exemplified, quote, the application of principles long recognized and applied in other settings. Those other settings? Early English state trials, where the maxim, nemo tenetur siepsum accusare, no one can be held to accuse himself, first took hold. But note the particular and peculiar claim to authority here. As Chief Justice Warren writes, this maxim wasn't exactly formalized then or now. In fact, it was founded, as the court notes, on no statute or judicial opinion at all, but instead, quote, from a general and upon a general and silent acquiescence of the courts in popular demand. The right in Miranda came not from words, but from silence. We'll see this move again. But note already Miranda's layered silence. The court's response to sometimes silent misconduct is to announce a rule about individual silence built on a foundation of silent acquiescence by courts. It is silence all the way down. And so it remains. Legal historians tend to find this risable. Leonard Levy, in response, said, quote, 
Now we all know the notorious fact, the Supreme Court flunked history. But Miranda stays with us, embedded, as Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote some 40 years later, in our national culture. Its silence then and now speaks volumes. One last detail. Ernest Miranda himself met a crueler fate. In January of 1976, after a fist fight at a poker game, he was stabbed to death. His killer fled, but an accomplice was caught, and when caught, read his rights from a card slotted in the arresting officer's pocket. That card bore a particular name, the victim's name, Miranda's name. Turn now to a second name, Barnett. In a way, the legal story of Gaethy and Marie Barnett starts with a case not their own. It starts with Gobitis, a name like Barnett itself actually misspelled in the Supreme Court record, which held in 1940 that a student's religious scruples did not provide a constitutional basis for her to refuse to cite the Pledge of Allegiance. Like the Barnetts, the students in Gobitis were children in a mining town, Jehovah's Witnesses expelled from school for refusing to swear loyalty to country instead of to God. So they filed suit. And the Gobitis children won at the district and circuit levels, but then lost at the Supreme Court. Justice Frankfurter writing that the ultimate foundation of a free society is the binding ties of cohesive sentiment. The binding ties of cohesive sentiment. So the pledge could be compelled, wrote Frankfurter. And at the time, seven other justices agreed. Violence followed, much of it aimed at Jehovah's Witnesses. Even the Chaplinsky case, so infamously about fighting words to First Amendment students, traces back to this brutal reaction. The scuffle in Chaplinsky, in which only he was charged, started not with him ranting about fascists unbidden, but with an attack on him as a Jehovah's Witness because he wouldn't salute the flag. But the Barnetts, like others, still refused. In fact, they, were, they refused, were expelled, and brought an unlikely class action just a couple of years after Gobitis. And surprisingly, they won at the district court. Still few accepted, expected the Supreme Court to affirm. Gobitis, after all, was still fresh. But the Supreme Court did affirm, Justice Jackson writing that the Bill of Rights does not leave it to public authorities to compel an individual to utter what is not in her mind. This was, to be sure, a dramatic moment, a surprising and surprisingly quick reversal and a forceful turn against compulsion. It was also, in its way, as much about a right to remain silent as Miranda ever was. But there is more to this silence, too. Consider, again, two layers. One, silence as condition. Note the heart of Barnett's logic. For the right to speak to be meaningful, one must also be able not to speak, that is, to keep quiet. Surely this is true. But this isn't simply a question of stilled voices. It is also a question of what Shauna Schifrin might call conducive speech conditions, the space and time and context necessary for sincere, deliberate communication to be possible, and for speech, therefore, to resonate as it must. These conditions, Barnett implies, are vital, and silence is critical to them. As much as anything, in fact, and without ever really saying so, Barnett makes this point clear. For speech to matter, we need the right setting. And that setting demands not just on words and mouths and ears and noise. Sometimes it demands and depends on silence. The quiet not just to listen, but not to speak at all. Barnett makes nothing more plain. But there's more, too. Silence as candor. Silence doesn't just facilitate speech. It doesn't just help create the conditions for sincere expression. It may be expression on its own. It may be the closest some can get in some conditions to candor to oneself. Consider the pre-decision plight of Mary and Gaethy Barnett. 
they had a choice. They could encant the pledge and stay in school, but thereby participate in a kind of forced insincerity to themselves, to their family, and to their religion. Or they could keep quiet and stay true to conscience, but thereby risk expulsion and perhaps violent reprisal. That is a terrible choice. The court in Barnett attempts to clear that choice out, to erase one risk, and to excuse the Barnetts for sitting silent where speech would be painful, compromised, compromising, and insincere. In Barnett, that is, the court understands silence as its own kind of expression and its own kind of truth. Silence here, then, is both space and solution room for expression and expression itself. And Barnett is thus not, in key ways, all that far from Miranda. But let's turn now to a third story, the most recent and surely the most unfamiliar, Ankenbrandt. Unlike Miranda and Barnett, Ankenbrandt is not famous. It features no legendary constitutional lesson and no iconic patriotic symbol. It features instead facts almost numbing in their quotidian sorrow. Carol Ankenbrandt and John Richards married young. Court records indicate that their first daughter, Lorelei, was born when the marriage was young too, for she was born on the very day her parents were wed, September 18, 1982. A second daughter, Stephanie, was born just two years later. Divorce soon followed, Carol keeping the two girls in Missouri John settling in Louisiana and starting a relationship with a woman named Deborah Kessler. An initial parental rights agreement sent the two girls to Louisiana for periodic visits with John and Deborah. But by 1988 or early 1989, the girls were returning to Missouri with accounts of truly horrific acts, being struck and fondled and raped by John and Deborah being chained to boards and furniture and then photo photographed in pornographic poses, and being threatened with even more violence should they ever mention anything about this abuse to anyone else. Despite these threats, they spoke. They told Carol, who quickly filed a request for a change to the visitation agreement in Louisiana, and she won. In May of 1989, a juvenile court in Louisiana terminated John's parental rights. It is not clear what, if any, criminal investigation followed. But the civil story is clearer to a point. In early 1990, Carol filed a tort suit against John and Deborah in federal district court. The hook for federal subject matter jurisdiction was diversity. Carol being a citizen of Missouri, the defendants being citizens of Louisiana, and the amount in controversy reaching almost $10 million. Yet the district court told Carol it could not hear her case. The Fifth Circuit agreed. Both said that there was an exception to the federal court's diversity jurisdiction in cases involving families, the so-called domestic relations exception to diversity jurisdiction. And so both said that Carol's claims must be heard elsewhere, if anywhere at all. In notable part, the Supreme Court agreed though it held that the particular kinds of claims Carol brought, tort claims, not custody or divorce or alimony claims, fell outside the domestic relations exception. It reaffirmed the existence of the domestic relations exception all the same, before and after Ankenbrand, the domestic relations exception endured. But here's a quirk. The domestic relations exception appears nowhere in any statute or rule. About it, Congress has said not a word. In Ankenbrandt, then, three federal courts recognized the existence of the domestic relations exception, but none could point to anything Congress had said in the domestic relations exception's favor. All they could point to was what Congress hadn't said, that is, to Congress's silence, nothing more. Now consider again two layers. One, silence at, as root. The court in Ankenbrandt is clear about one thing. The Constitution does not exclude domestic relation cases from the jurisdiction of the federal courts. It says nothing about it, not a word. 
If the domestic relations exception exists then, it is not a function of the Constitution without more. But it's not easy to find the domestic relations exception in statute or anywhere else either. The key provision here, 28 U.S.C. section 1332, uses no such term and makes no such exception. So where do we find its root? We find it in silence, or more to the point, in, in the acquiescence that silence can be heard to connote. Years before Ankenbrandt, the court itself had crafted the do domestic relations exception, an exclusion from federal courts of cases involving divorce, custody, or alimony. Congress never approved of this term, but it never spoke against it either. Congress was simply silent, and this, the Ankenbrandt court tells us, is enough. Silence isn't protest here. It is apparent acceptance, the court says, of the rule. And perhaps this seems odd. Perhaps it should seem odd. But note a couple things. A, we've seen this already. In fact, we saw much the same thing in Miranda. The same idea of silence being acquiescence and acquiescence in turn being acceptance, the source and root of a legal rule. B, there's a deeper silence here too. Dig far enough into the history of the domestic relations exception, and one sees, I believe, the ugly seed of coverture, the old gendered notion that in marriage the woman was subsumed in the identity of the man. This idea, again, I believe, made diversity jurisdiction in domestic relations cases wholly incongruous to old and fusty judges for they simply couldn't contemplate women having identities and citizenships separate from their husbands. It was also, incidentally, what spurred the growth of things like spousal testimonial privilege and enforced silence of a different type. But there's more. Two, silence as room. Consider here Justice Blackmun's dissent in Ankenbrandt. Justice Blackman doesn't think federal courts should be hearing divorce, alimony, or custody cases either. But he doesn't believe that Congress's silence forecloses the possibility. Instead, he writes, any inaction on the part of Congress in failing expressly to mention domestic relations matters reflects the fact that Congress likely had no idea until today that the diversity statute contained an exception for domestic relations matters. Congress had no idea. They simply didn't think about it. And this is, without question, right. But right or wrong, note what Blackman's position acknowledges regardless. Silence in Ankin Brand does two things, not just one. It creates room for dialogue here between Congress and the courts, and it becomes part of the dialogue itself. It opens space for discussion and it participates in that discussion. It is space and its own kind of sound. This is vital and important and in its way exactly like Barnett. In familiar and surprising turns and in familiar and unfamiliar places, we can't help but see and hear what we're after. We can't help but see and hear law as a proof of salient silence and silence as a pivotal part of law. If nothing else, our three cases, our three stories confirm as much. But this leaves one more question. So what? Legal silence may be meaningful, potent, powerful, articulate, both good and bad, both Olmstead and Whitney. But what does that prove? Why does it matter? I'd like to hazard, and this is quite preliminary, that it matters along four dimensions. It matters for reasons of connection, comparison, coherence, and capacity. And I'll say something very brief about each. I think first that there is something worthwhile, meaningful, and essential in the connection of seemingly disparate things. In examining together puzzle pieces so very often, often left on different sides of the board. There's something fruitful, for example, in standing Miranda and Ankenbrandt side by side in seeing a connected thread of silence as acquiescence and acceptance, 
not just as the root of very different legal rules, Miranda warnings and the domestic relations exception, but as a source of legal authority, structural power, judicial rhetoric in diverse places. Alone, these stories are evocative. Together, they may be mutually, even symbiotically revealing. But there is value not here not just in connection. The value is also in exacting comparison. In assessing if pieces are linked, yes, but also how they look in counterpoint. There's something use worthwhile, for example, in comparing the idea of silence as a meaningful condition in Miranda and Barnett. The first about setting a scene through protected silence for criminal justice to take hold. The second about carving out room through protected silence for fidelity to one's own religious and political conscience. By themselves, these stories are famous and provocative. Together, they can hint, like Justice Brandeis' opinions in Whitney and Olmsted, at deeper features of our social commitments and our shared political character. This is not to say that these commitments and that fabric are consistent and complete. They are not, and perhaps can't ever be. But the story of legal silence has value here too, as a window into these limits and as a lens into the law's incoherence. There's something worthwhile, for example, in seeing where Barnett and Ankenbrandt come together and where they pull apart where they both acknowledge silence as the foundation of healthy dialogue, as well as its own kind of dialogic entry, yet also where only one case uses silence to enforce and elaborate the rights of the politically unpopular, while the other uses silence to keep a desperate parent in doubt of her access to legal relief. We should care about these silences, and we should care about these people. The politically unpopular and the desperate parents deserve our attention, and I've tried to give them some attention here. But they deserve more than quick glimpses or pithy summaries, and the stories they inhabit, well, they warrant more than cursory review. They deserve to be seen and heard, engaged as legal lessons and as human tragedies, as fodder for academic engagement and fuel for deeper inquiry. And here, then, is a fourth reason this matters, as well as a concluding call. There is value in our study of legal silence as a test of our capacity as lawyers, as thinkers, and as people. It is a check on and a challenge to our ability, our willingness, and our need, not just to understand legal silence for what it is and will always be, but to do the hard work of searching out that meaning in a world full of noise. There is value, for example, in asking if we are willing to find meaning in what Ernest Miranda wished not to say, in what Gaethy and Marie Barnett wished not to pledge, in what Congress and Engenbrandt wished not to legislate. That meaning is there to be found. It is particular and powerful and articulate. It is worth hearing if we have the will, the capacity to listen. We should listen. We must listen. In life, in law, and apparently in presidential election polling, it is sometimes what we don't hear, the silence that is most important, the most articulate expression amid the noise. So I will end almost where we began, with John Cage. We must conceive of silence in order to open up our ears. Let's open them up. I thank you again for opening your ears to me. Please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fred, for that uh, deeply thoughtful, enlightening, and highly elegant uh, presentation. Um, Fred is, will be willing to, he tells me, answer questions, but uh, over a beer. Um, and, uh, so we'll, we'll, we're all invited now to Betcher Hall for a reception. Thank you very much for coming.